everyone to one week at a time. Uh, we are in Masechet Sukkah, and uh, this is our fifth lesson in Masechet Sukkah. Uh, today, we are going to be reviewing Daf 28 through uh, 34, so Kaf Chet through Lamed Dalid. Uh, and we are going to be finishing the second chapter uh, in Masechet Sukkah, and we are going to beginning, begin the third chapter. Um, Okay, let's begin at Daf uh, 28, Chavchet. Uh, Chavchet sorry. Uh, we finished off speaking about Rabbi Eliezer. So um, the Gemara here reminds us that uh, once Rabbi Eliezer was in the Galil and he was asked many questions uh, and he wasn't really answering those questions in a very direct way. And I, if you remember, we have seen this before in other Masechtot. Um, where basically uh, Rabbi Eliezer only answers questions um, when he, uh, or he only teaches things that he learned from his rabbi. Um, so when he did not learn something directly from his rabbi, he will not answer uh, the question directly. So that was just very interesting um, to, to see, to, to understand uh, the teaching methods of Rabbi Eliezer. Uh, and then uh, Rabbi Eliezer describes um, how he learned in the study hall in the Beit Midrash. He would get there early, he would be the last to leave, uh, and uh, he was very serious in his learning. Uh, not only was he very serious, but he uh, encouraged his students as well to take their learning very seriously uh, in the sense that they were uh, expected to stay um, in the study hall, in the Beit Midrash, uh, and only go home on uh, the day of um, Yom Kippur, meaning Erev Yom Kippur, the day before uh, Yom Kippur and the day before Pesach, uh, so that they can uh, be home for those days, but otherwise they were learning uh, full time. Uh, and since we're talking about teachers and students, um, the Gemara talks about Hillel, uh, Hillel, who had 80 students, uh, and who was the greatest of them and who was the least, meaning, uh, you know, the, the, the least, uh, I guess, studious of them all was Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai. And we know uh, Rabbi Yochanan is one of the, the greatest sages. So it's interesting that he was, um, you know, didn't even rank in all the students of Hillel. Uh, and how uh, Rabbi, you know, Rabbi Yochan ben Zakkai mastered uh, all of his learning and all different uh, types of learning, not only um, in text, but also um, other things such as astronomy uh, and I, I would say Kabbalistic ideas, spiritual ideas. Um, okay, and uh, with that, we're going to go to the Mishnah on Daf 28. Um, and we've we've mentioned this before, but here is actually the source that if your uh, head and most of your body fits in the sukkah, but your table is in the house. Uh, again, this there's a disagreement. Uh, Beit Shammai says that this is invalid. Uh, remember, we discussed that Be that Beit Shammai was concerned that you would get uh, kind of drawn into the house, and we don't want that. Um, so they said that that is invalid. Beit Hillel said it is valid because, again, it, your sukkah is the minimum size, uh, and therefore um, it should be valid. Uh, since we're talking about who, um, how to sit in the sukkah, uh, the Gemara continues and tells us that women and slaves and children are exempt from the mitzvah of sitting in the sukkah. Um, and what, what does it mean, a child? A child who doesn't need his mother. Uh, he, uh, if he doesn't need his mother, so then he is obligated uh, in sukkah. And of course, the Gemara is going to under, try to understand uh, what does this mean, right? Interestingly enough, we usually talk about a very objective age, right? Uh, the age of, let's say, bar mitzvah. A child is either 13 or he's not 13. Uh, but here, interestingly, the Gemara talks about um, being be, needing your mother. So we'll hold off for a minute and we'll see how the Gemara discusses that. Um, uh, Shammai actually made a sukkah 
uh, for his uh, daughter over his daughter's uh, if for his daughter over the baby's bed. So you can see here that Shammai thought uh, that actually young, very young children uh, need to be in a sukkah. So we have to understand what this means. Um, so the Gemara says uh, again, uh, Ha Ezrach, the resident, needs to be in a sukkah, and this excludes women. Um, or uh, again, we know, and we have mentioned this before, any time-bound mitzvah, uh, women are not obligated in uh, in that commandment, uh, meaning uh, hearing the shofar, the lulav, sitting in the sukkah. Again, this does not mean that you cannot do it. It just means that you are not obligated to do it. Again, just to try to understand this a little bit better, uh, definitely in the time of the Mishnah, the Gemara, um, this category of people, women, slaves, and children, their time is not necessarily their own. Uh, they have a lot of things to do. They have errands. Uh, and therefore, the sages felt that uh, they would not need to be obligated uh, to, to do these mitzvot, again, because they are time sensitive. Um, okay. Uh, again, the, the Gemara brings this up again. Uh, so again, if it's a time-bound mitzvah, women are not obligated to do it. Why did the Mishnah need to teach us that they are exempt? Uh, the, so the Gemara says, first of all, it's important to understand that in general, men and women are equally obligated in commandments, in the mitzvot. Um, but again, anything that is time-bound or most things that are time-bound, women are, uh, are exempt. Um, okay. Uh, again, what about children? So as we mentioned, uh, we have this concept of the, it's in Hebrew we say gil chinuch, uh, the age in which uh, the child, we want to educate the child, right? If we're living in a uh, Shabbat observant home, you're not going to let your children, you know, turn on the lights, watch TV, uh, even though really, uh, as minors, they are exempt, or, or let's say they are less uh, obligated, uh, but we want to teach the children uh, how to keep these these commandments. Uh, so to here, uh, but interestingly, we said that's not the the age, right? We we didn't say it's the the age of education. Rather, uh, it's the age where they don't need their mother. So. What does this mean, right? So one opinion is it's a child who can go to the bathroom alone. Uh, so all mothers with young children can understand what this means, right? At a certain age, your child can go to the bathroom on their own. Um, or uh, maybe it's that when they, 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 let's say, wake up in the middle of the night, uh, they don't call out for their mother. Uh, the Gemara says, what are you talking about? I know 15-year-olds that wake up in the middle of the night and, you know, might call for their mother. Um, so here the Gemara says, well, it means you don't call repeatedly, right? Ima, ima, ima. Okay, that's already uh, a younger child. Um, and it seems that Shammai was more stringent. As we saw in the Mishnah, he did uh, build a sukkah over the baby's uh, or the young child's bed. Okay, the next Mishnah on 28, the sukkah should be a permanent dwelling for the week. Again, it's interesting because we talk about it being a temporary dwelling, uh, but here it needs to be, uh, again, a permanent dwelling for a limited amount of time. What does that mean? Uh, and, and we'll see in the Gemara. Uh, the Gemara continues, the Mishnah continues and tells us what happens if it rains. Uh, and those of you definitely who, who live in, uh, I would say, North America and probably in England as well uh, are used to probably rain during Sukkot. In Israel, it is less common, though it, it does happen. Um, what happens if it rains? So the Mishnah says that if your food is going to get ruined, uh, then, right, meaning it's not just one or two drops are falling, but if your food will get ruined, that amount of rain will uh, enable you to go into the house. Um, and the Mishnah says it's like a servant who gave a cup to his master and then he throws it in his face. We're not sure who he is in the end of that, that uh, parable, so we'll see that in the Gemara as well. So again, what does it mean to be a permanent dwelling? The Gemara says, well, you need to bring vessels and sheets and decorations into the sukkah. Again, those of you who um, build your own sukkah, we know that we take out a, a table and a chair 
Uh, I have a friend who actually moved her couch into the sukkah. Uh, the kids bring all their games into the sukkah. Uh, the idea really is that the sukkah should be a place that you are living in for, uh, for the week. So that's just uh, uh, something to think about as we get closer to Sukkot. Um, you should spend time in the sukkah, right? If you have friends over, you should hang out in the sukkah. You should learn in the sukkah. Um, and uh, uh, it's just interesting on how we spend our time during Sukkot. Um, the, the top of Daf 29 uh, says that, um, uh, again, you have to also keep it clean, just like your house. So um, you can leave like your gl your drinking glasses there, uh, but you shouldn't leave your dirty dishes there. It's not very uh, respectful for the sukkah. Um, you can bring out a lamp. Um, and again, the lamps in those days would get uh, pretty dirty. So if it was very dirty, if it's a small sukkah, you shouldn't leave the lamp out there, um, lest it you know start to smell or give off uh, a, again a, a, a less respectable. Uh, uh, environment. Okay, let's talk about rain. Uh, so the Gemara says again, uh, you can leave the sukkah if your food is going to get ruined. This seems to be very subjective. Um, and the Gemara adds that you don't have to go back out in the middle of the meal, right? I remember growing up in, in New York, right? You would go out and make kiddish, and then it would start to rain, so then you'd move in, and then like a kid would come and say, oh, it stopped raining, and then you always said, oh, should we go out, should we stay? Uh, so the Gemara actually says once you move inside, you do not have to go back outside for that meal. Again, for the next meal, you should go back outside. Um, the same thing with sleeping, right? Again, if it's uh, raining and it's uncomfortable, you should go inside. Uh, you do not have to wake up at four in the morning to go back outside if it stops raining. So it's just to re recognize that uh, you can spend the night indoors uh, if it was uncomfortable. Um, uh, okay, uh, and from here, the, since we're talking about uh, um, what's going on, like, I guess, uh, in the weather or in nature, uh, the Gemara talks about uh, this, right, again, if it's raining, it seems to be uh, displeasure, right? One might say that it's uh, God uh, may be not happy with the Jewish people if it's raining over Sukkot. Um, and since we're talking about this, the Gemara goes into other natural occurrences or maybe unnatural occurrences and how they might be seen, be seen as, uh, a, a, let's call it a bad sign. So the Gemara says if there's a solar eclipse, that's a bad sign. Uh, it's, right, it's God taking away the light for us. Right. So it's interesting, again, how do we see nature and how do we understand it on a spiritual uh, side? Right. If it's a lunar eclipse, um, so then it's a bad sign, right, that the, the Jewish people have to recognize that um, God is sending us a message and that we have to be better, right, that we have to improve. Um, interesting, the Gemara says that if it's a solar eclipse, it's a bad sign for the non-Jews. If it's a lunar eclipse, it's a bad sign for us. Uh, if it's a red sun, uh, it means that there's war that's going to come to the world. If it's a dark sun, then famine is going to come. So it's interesting to understand. Again, um, we we know that the the time of the Gemara, they did understand um, astronomy in the sense that they knew that there are uh, celestial beings that orbit and, and they do uh, go in front of the other. But it's interesting how they're interpreting these uh, natural or unnatural occurrences and seeing a, a spiritual message in them. So that I think is very interesting. Um, okay, uh, again, the Gemara gives reasons for a lunar eclipse. It gives reasons why people will lose their property, uh, reasons why, um, again, uh, the, the haughty people will lose the property and the humble people will inherit the land. Uh, and with that, we finish the second chapter of Masechet Sukkah. Uh, and now we're going to start the third chapter. Now, the first two chapters were all about the actual Sukkah, 
right? So just as a review, we talked about a minimum uh, size, a maximum size, a maximum height. Uh, we talked about the materials that we can or cannot use. Um, so now we're going to move on to the four species, our bat haminim, the lulav, the etrog, uh, the hadas, and the arava. Uh, and we're going to go through each one of these. Um, those of you who have ever been to a, um, I don't know what they're called in, in outside of Israel. In Israel, it's called a shuk arbat haminim. Uh, I guess you'd call it a lulav sale. Um, so if you've ever been to one, uh, you can see people, uh, you know, kind of really examining each one of the species. Uh, so if you ever were wondering, what are they looking at? Why are they doing this? This is the chapter for you. Uh, we're going to talk about each one of the four species and um, what makes it valid or what makes it invalid. Um, so it, it's important to understand uh, that, and this also is very interesting, that um, the, a lot of these details are really about the beauty of this mitzvah. Uh, the idea is that the, the four species need to be beautiful. You can see them here on the picture, uh, and I'm going to share a lot of pictures with you in a minute. But the idea is not like if it's dried out, um, you know, you're doing the, the mitzvah wrong, ra as opposed to like in the sukkah, right? We didn't talk about beautiful versus non, not. We talked to the, about measurements and distances. Here, it's really about how can we create the most beautiful etrog, the most beautiful lulav. And we'll go through each one of these things and we'll, we'll try to understand why this is um, as we uh, go through each one of the species. Um, so let me share some pictures with you. Okay, a minute. Okay, and okay, and I have my chat box. Okay, um, so here we go. We're going to start with the lulav. Uh, and we're going to, each Mishnah is going to go through each species. Just as a, um, a spoiler, I'm not going to do the etrog today. Uh, we started the etrog on today's daf, but it was towards the end, so I'm going to leave it for next week. So uh, you'll have to stay tuned for the etrog, but we're going to do the other three. Um, so let's start with the lulav. Um, and here, again, very famously, uh, the Mishnah tells us that a Stolen lulav is invalid. Uh, again, we're going to see in a little bit that the, the Torah tells us, v'lakachtem, you need to take for yourself, meaning you need to own the four species, um, and therefore you cannot steal it. Uh, if anybody has seen the movie Ushpizin, uh, this comes up. So just uh, if you haven't seen it, definitely watch it before uh, before Sukkot. But these things do come up. Um, okay, so let's do the Mishnah. So again, a stolen or dried out lulav uh, is invalid. Again, if it's dried out, it's not beautiful. Um, if it comes from something that was worshipped uh, as an idol, right, or uh, idolatry, uh, an asherah tree, or it came from a city uh, that where they, all the people in the city uh, were idol worshippers, again, Jewish people who were idol worshippers, this is called an ir nidachat. Uh, there's a special rule that uh, a city where all the Jews became idol worshippers needs to be destroyed, actually, and everything in it needs to be destroyed. And therefore, um, a lulav from that city is viewed as if it's been destroyed and it's as if it doesn't exist. Uh, so that's just very interesting. Um, the, the Mishnah continues and says that if the tip of the lulav was cut off, that's this picture here, you can see um, that there's a, the, the tip. If it gets cut off, uh, that is invalid. Um, if the leaves uh, become separated, right? Again, most lulavim look like this. If they're very separated, uh, then they are, um, they are invalid. Um, or maybe it's okay. Again, there are two different opinions. Maybe if it's very separated, you see here, uh, then one opinion is you would have to um, tie it up. And we're going to talk about tying in a few minutes. Um, but one opinion is you might have to tie it up. If anybody has ever seen 
um, a Sephardi uh, lulav, they tie up their lulav, uh, similar to this. Um, okay, the Gemara also, the Mishnah also says that a uh, palm branch from uh, the Har Barzel, which translated means the mountain of iron, but it's a place. Um, so this uh, lulav is valid, right? Even though it's shorter, you can see here each each leaf is shorter than what we're used to, um, but it is still valid uh, and it is okay. Uh, and then the Mishnah also says that the lulav needs to be um, at least three tfachim to be able to shake it. Again, tfachim, our hand breath, they need to be at least three tfachim because we need to shake it. Okay. Let's go to the Gemara. Uh, da, um, again, we said stolen or dried um, is invalid for all seven days, says the Gemara. Uh, the Gemara at the top of Daf 30 tells us uh, why this is. Again, um, if you steal the, the uh, lulav, it's again, you're, the, the concept in Hebrew is called mitzvah haba be'avera. Right. What does that mean? You're doing a mitzvah, but the way you did it was through a transgression, right? You transgressed in order to do a commandment. The, the Gemara says that's not okay. You can't say, oh, um, I forgot to do, I forgot to buy lulav. I'll just steal my neighbors because I really want to do that mitzvah. It doesn't work that way, right? You can't steal in order to do a mitzvah. We say it's, uh, it's invalid. Um, Right again, right. God doesn't want us to to rob. He he doesn't want us to steal, um, and therefore it is invalid. Uh, again, what about dry? Dry is also invalid. Why? Again, because here we have the concept of hadar. Now we're going to see it really in the etrog. Right? It says in the Torah that the etrog is a pre et hadar. Now it's translated as the fruit of a citrus tree, right? In, in Hebrew, an etz hadar or pre hadar is citrus. Um, but the word hadar, as in hidur mitzvah, means to beautify. Um, so since we have the word hadar here, um, this is uh, going to be taken for all of the four species that they need to be beautiful. Uh, so that's just, I think, a, a very interesting idea that, um, our, our mitzvot need to be done in a beautiful way. Uh, so again, it can't be dry because it's not beautiful. Um, okay, we can, however, right, we said you can't steal the lulav, but you can borrow it. Um, so that is okay. Um, maybe not for the first day. We're going to see that the first day is going to be more stringent. And uh, therefore, uh, th you might have to own your, excuse me, your own lulav for the first day. But for su subsequent days, you might be able to, um, you might be able to um, borrow it. Um, okay. Uh, hold on one second. Ah. Since we're talking about stealing items, so the Gemara explains, and this is really, you, you, we're going to learn it later on when we get to, um, the, to Baba Kama, when we talk about uh, more legal issues. Um, but when you steal an object, right, one would think that you need to return that object. That is true. Um, however, if you make a, a change to that object, you improve it. Uh, then the Gemara actually says that you do not have to return the actual item. You do have to compensate. Uh, you have to pay back uh, the person that you stole it from, and there are reparations uh, and fines, but you do not have to actually return that, or that object. Um, so the question is here, uh, what happens if you stole uh, let's say the hadasim, right? Another one of the species, and you you attached it to your lulav. Um, maybe then uh, you don't have to return it. It's as if you acquired it. Uh, and here we're going to get to the concept of binding the four species. Um, in Hebrew, it's called eged, 
uh, which is interesting. Anybody who's ever been to Israel, uh, if you've ever taken a bus in Jerusalem, the bus company is called Eged. Uh, Eged means to bind. But here I think it means, right, to connect everybody together. Um, here the Gemara talks about binding the four species. Uh, we know that they need to come together. And we'll see uh, as we speak uh, in today's class, uh, there's a difference of opinion whether the four species need to be bound together or not. Um, so that's what we're going to, to discuss here. Uh, okay, the top of 31. Uh, again, since we're talking about stealing the lulav, what about stealing a sukkah? Right, can you sit in a stolen sukkah? I think that was the scene in Ushbizin, right? He steals some wood or something to build his sukkah. Um, so it's interesting. Uh, so the, the Gemara tells us on 31 that a stolen sukkah, or if you build your sukkah in a public area where it's not your own property. Um, so Rabbi Eliezer says this is an invalid sukkah. Uh, you cannot sit on it. It is sit in it, and it doesn't. Uh, it doesn't work. Uh, the sages actually say it is valid. It is okay. Um, the question is when, right? So the, the the Gemara teaches us that when the sukkah is attached to the ground. So then, uh, and this is again is something we're going to learn when we talk more about legal issues. Um, gr land cannot be stolen. Right, you can squat on somebody's land, but you can't steal someone's field. Uh, the same thing here. If the sukkah is right, how do you steal someone's house? You can't pick it up and move it. Uh, but if so, therefore, uh, the sages say there's really no such thing as stealing a sukkah because it's attached to the ground. Right? If I go into your sukkah and I sit in it, I didn't steal it. I'm I'm using your sukkah, but I didn't steal it. Um, the the Gemara though says. Uh, again, right, you, you can, right, those of you who have uh, been invited to friends on Sukkot, right, you can sit in your friend's sukkah, uh, I guess, with or without permission. Uh, I would suggest with permission. Uh, so then that is okay. You have fulfilled the, the uh, commandment to sit in a, meet, in a sukkah. Um, but, right, again, nowadays, you know, those prefab Sukkot, if you can actually pick up the sukkah and take it to your house, that would be called stealing a sukkah, and that would be problematic. Uh, so please, no, no stealing sukkot. Um, okay, uh, there's an interesting story that I think some people, uh, when reading it, were very troubled with. So uh, I'll, I'll just mention it here. Uh, there's a woman who comes uh, and um, screams uh, to, the, to the rabbi saying that, um, the Reish Galuta, again, the Reish Galuta is the political leader, Jewish leader in, in, in the area. Um, so I guess you could call it like the mayor of the town or something like that. Um, so she says that he stole her wood and the sukkah that everybody's sitting in is stolen. And she's yelling and screaming and she wants justice. Um, unfortunately, uh, the rabbi says to her, stop yelling. Uh, you know, you're, 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 I don't want to use the word overreacting, but you know, you're yelling too much, calm down. Uh, and really, um, he, you're right that, uh, maybe he stole the wood, but because he used it to build his sukkah, so he changed, uh, the, as I mentioned before, he changed the object a little bit and therefore he does not need to return the wood. He does need to pay her back. Um, so it's interesting to think about what this story is really telling us. Um, uh, I don't think it's saying that women are loud and yelling. I, I do think that it's a woman who's seeking justice. Um, it could be that his response is really based on politics, right? Again, I think that the, the rabbis are really uh, kind of, uh, I would say, in a precarious position because they don't want to speak uh, ill against the political uh, leader of the town. Uh, so that's uh, one theory that uh, uh, my friend Susan Suna came up with. I thought that was interesting. Um, so I, I'm not sure really what, what else to, to learn from this, but uh, I'm happy to hear if anybody else has a comment about it. Otherwise, I'm going to move on. Okay. Um, a dry, as again, a dry lulav. Uh, we said there's actually a machloket. There's a difference of opinion uh, whether it is valid or not. Uh, and it basically comes from this idea, as I mentioned before, the word hadar is mentioned for etrog. 
So for sure, the etrog needs to be beautiful. And then the question is, do we say all four species need to be beautiful or just the etrog? And that's really the difference of opinion. Um, again, um, the lulav and the other species, uh, again, as we said, is going to be a, a machloket if they need to be tied together. Uh, and if you tie them together, they need to be tied with the same um, with one of the four species. So uh, those of you who are familiar, most of the time we we tie the, the species together with p um, palm branches, right? You take off one leaf and there's a knot that people do and that, that's how they uh, that's how they tie their uh, their lulav. Um, the reason is because if I would tie it with something else, Right. Let's say I would take a, a branch from another tree. I all of a sudden am introducing a fifth species. Right. And I don't want it. I have to have only four. Uh, and therefore, you use the palm branch to tie uh, to tie the the species together. Right. So the Gemara says you cannot add or subtract from these four species. So let's say uh, if you do not have an etrog, uh, again, uh, people who lived, uh, you know, uh, a hundred years ago in Poland, uh, it was, I'm sure, very difficult to get an etrog out, uh, you know, to, to where they were. Um, you cannot take a lemon instead. You can't say, oh, it looks like an etrog, so I'll, I'll take a lemon. The Gemara says, no, uh, it needs to be the four species, not more and not less. Um, interestingly, the Gemara relates that there was a community where it was very hard to get these four species, and they would save it from one year to the next, and they would actually pass it down to their grandchildren. Uh, so here again, this is seen as a proof that maybe you could use a dried lulav. Um, the Gemara says we don't learn from extenuating circumstances, right? Really, um, you should use a fresh uh, uh, lulav and etrog, um, but uh, if there are extenuating circumstances, there are extenuating circumstances. So that's just interesting. Uh, I think also um, people who uh, live in very vibrant Jewish communities are used to, I would say, many people in the synagogue having the lulav and the etrog. Uh, but if you go to places where there are much fewer Jews, uh, it is much harder. Uh, so I've seen communities where, you know, just the rabbi has the lulav and etrog, and then after synagogue, everybody gets a turn to shake the lulav. Uh, so just interesting to understand that um, Things that we take for granted really, I think, shouldn't be taken for granted. Um, okay. Um, hold on one second. Uh, let's keep going. Uh, okay. So since we mentioned the etrog, again, we'll talk about it next week. But here, uh, the Gemara says that um, if it's green, so the, there's a machloket if it's valid or not. Um, but if it's not ripe, it is uh, not valid, right? It has to be ripened, uh, and it has to be a certain size, right? It can't be too small, and it can't be too large, which is interesting because if anybody's ever seen a temani, uh, a temani etrog, it's actually, uh, I don't want to say the size of a football, but it's pretty close. It's really large. Um, so the Gemara says uh, you have to be able to hold it with two hands, um, and then, you know, if you can hold it with two hands, then that's okay. Uh, some say, actually, it's better to be able to hold it in one hand. This way, when you hold the four species, uh, you're able to kind of maneuver with them in your hand. We don't want you to drop them. Um, again, um, we use the word hadar to mean beautiful. But another explanation on Daf 3031 is hadar, that resides, that lives. What does that mean? Um, the etrog comes from a tree that there are um, that there are um, uh, etrogim there from year to year. It doesn't have a state. Um, it doesn't have a um, like one. Uh, what's the word? Harvest season. It's like a lemon where uh, throughout the year uh, different lemons become ripened. So that's what is hadar instead of hidur. Um, Sarah's asking, how can you use an etrog if it's large enough to require to? Again, you have to, I don't know, be very creative. It's a good question. Uh, I think that you, uh, 
you you lean it against the lulav and you hold it very carefully. It's a, you're not definitely not going to be able to hold your sitter at the same time. That's for sure. Uh, so it, it's a good question. Um, I find we'll, we should find a Sephardi person and see what they answer. Um, okay. Again, um, the Gemara continues and says that if it's um, if it was the tree was worshipped, uh, it cannot be used for uh, the mitzvah. Again, it needs to be um, for God. And if something was used for idol worship, then it is seen as um, inappropriate to use for for God. Um, okay. From here, uh, the Gemara is going to talk about. Uh, the the way that the the lulav looks now the lulav has a a spine in the center and then it has leaves that kind of grow beyond it and kind of come to a point um, so um, we said that oh, okay so uh, the top that point is called the tiomet from the word teom like twins. Um, so it's called the tiomet, and um, if that tip gets cut, so then it's invalid. Um, what if it's split? You can see here a picture if it's split. Again, there's two uh, two ways to understand split. Either you can see here um, split all the way at the top, or maybe split, um, you know, all the way down, uh, all the way down to the bottom. Um, so uh, we're now at the top of 32. Um, so then uh, th those would be, uh, again, some say that those would be um, valid. Those would be valid. Um, okay. Um, what does it mean? Can you make a lulav if you have all four species? I don't understand the question. If you have them in your garden? Okay. So, yeah, of course. So you'll have to... You'll have to learn all the, the rules, and then, of course, you can harvest all of these things in your garden. Uh, so everyone is invited to Arizona to get some four species. Um, okay, let's continue. Uh, the Gemara says that what if the top looks very nice, but the bottom has these thorns? Uh, that is not okay. Uh, again, here we want, we want to make sure that it is... Um, comfortable to hold. If it's not comfortable to hold, uh, then that is invalid. Uh, if you, it's very spread out like this, uh, if you have a palm tree, right? So different palm trees grow differently. So if the leaves look like this, this is invalid. Uh, it needed to look, as we saw before, uh, all in one uh, kind of concentrated area. Um, the Gemara continues and tells us that if it's bent, uh, this is also um, problematic, um, but if it's, uh, again, if it's bent in one way, if it's bent forward, it's invalid, but if it's bent backwards, that would be uh, okay. Uh, it's a machloket if it's bent uh, sideways, that's another, uh, that's another question. Um, okay, uh, again, um, hold on one minute. Um, Okay, if the branches, if the leaves start to branch off a little bit, you do need to tie them together um, because uh, they need to be um, um, close to each other, says the Gemara. Um, uh, we mentioned again the lulav from the Harahar Barzel, that it was valid even though the leaves were short. Um, the Gemara says that it's okay as long as the tip of one leaf touches the end of the the bottom of the next leaf uh so they're kind of uh touching each other and then that would be uh that would be okay um again here the gemara says that it needs to be uh three tfachim for the hadasim and the aravot um but four tfachim for the lulav um or maybe the spine of the lulav needs to be more than four tfachim right again it needs to be a certain height uh, so that uh, you can shake it. Uh, again, the question is, can you include the tip of the leaves or not in this measurement? Um, okay, let's go to the hadas, right? This is the myrtle branch. Uh, so again, it's going to sound very similar. If it's stolen or dry, it is invalid. Again, same reasons. If it was worshipped for idolatry, it is invalid. Um, if the top of it was cut off, or the leaves were torn off, 
Uh, so that's this picture here. So then it's invalid. Uh, so it would be the majority of the leaves. Uh, and those of you who have uh, a myrtle brand, a bush, uh, you know that they actually have berries on them at certain times. Uh, so if there are more berries than leaves, it would be invalid. Uh, again, interestingly enough, um, but you could remove them and then it would be valid. Just you're not allowed to remove the berries on the festival itself. You have to do it before the festival. Um, the Gemara says that, uh, again, in the Torah, uh, what, the Hadas it's, is called Anaf et Avot. And this means a branch of a, uh, a tree that is, um, I, we'll call it uh, braided together or bound together, avot. Uh, and here, uh, the, the Gemara says that the, the tips need, the leaves, sorry, the leaves need to cover the stem. As you can see here, um, all the leaves are covering the stem. You can't really see the stem, right? Ah, avot means to overlap. So you need that overlapping of the, uh, of the leaves. Um, and it looks braided. That's why I said the word braided. Um, and uh, this needs to, the, the leaves need to taste uh, the same as the actual tree, right? This is where uh, um, there are a lot of stories about uh, the different species, how some taste good and some smell good. Uh, we'll talk about that maybe another time. Um, here, uh, this is also very interesting and important when we're checking the Hadassim. One, um, one opinion is that you need three leaves to grow out of the same on the same level, right? You can see here the three are on the same level, or um, at least two, right? You can see here there's two growing on one level, and then one comes from either below uh, and kind of um, covers them up. So then that would be okay. Um, if the majority of the leaves fell off. It's still valid as long as the leaves cover the stem. So that would be the picture that we saw before, right? If, if the leaves are covering the stem, uh, then it would still be okay. Excuse me. Um, okay, let's talk about these berries. Um, uh, the, so the Gemara says that um, we're now on DAF 33, um, that... Um, if you have three hadasim with three moist leaves at the top of each one, it's still valid. Because uh, again, from the top, it still looks beautiful. Um, we said that if the tip of the hadas got cut off and, and a bud grew on top of it, by the way, those of you who are also looking at the Gemara in Hebrew, the word for that bud is a tmara like Tamara, so I just thought I would mention that. Um, so the question is, um, what happens if that bud grows on, on the top? So then it would be valid. Um, but if it grew on the festival itself, here now there's a difference of opinion if it's valid or not. Uh, and here we have a very, um, I think it's a very interesting principle of, in, in Hebrew it's called, um, dihui. Dihui means to push aside. Uh, what does that mean? Um, the, the Gemara asks that if you can, uh, at a certain point, not fulfill a mitzvah, a commandment, and then later on you can, do we say that since originally uh, you couldn't, so then that's it, you don't have to do it anymore? Or do we say, no, if I have another opportunity, uh, so then I should do it. Um, so here, dihui isn't so much on the person, rather on the object, right? Meaning, uh, if the hadas at the beginning of the festival was invalid because the top was cut off, um, so at the beginning of the festival, it was invalid. But now on the festival, this, this thing grew on top, uh, do I say, well, it was already kind of set aside at the beginning, so therefore it's invalid, even though I could use it now? Or do I say, no, I have a new opportunity, and therefore um, I can uh, fulfill the mitzvah with it? Uh, so that's really going to be, that's a machloket here on this daf. Uh, it seems that 
the bottom line is that you can fulfill the mitzvah with it, meaning we say, Ein uh, it's not uh, permanently pushed off. Uh, rather, if it is, uh, again, once again, valid, uh, so then you can use it. Um, okay, uh, again, uh, this, the, the machloket about binding the four species comes up again here. Uh, Rabbi Yehuda says they need eged, they need to be bound together. Uh, this is learned actually from um, Pesach in Egypt. Uh, the Jews were told, Vilekachtem, you need to take the hyssop, and that hyssop needed to be bound together, and that was how they put the blood on the doorpost. Uh, and since it uses the word, you shall take, uh, and it also says here, and you should take the lulav, Rabbi Yehuda says that um, therefore the four species need to be bound together, literally tied together. Um, the sages say uh, we do not learn from Pesach, and therefore they do not have to be uh, tied together. You, you do have to hold them together, but they don't have to be tied together. So that's, uh, that's very interesting. Uh, again, here we see this concept. We learned it in Masechet Shabbat um, from a pasuk from uh, the song at the Red Sea, Az Yashir, um, right? It's called uh, Shirat Hayam. Uh, the verse says, Ze keli ve'anvehu, right? The Lord is my God and I will um, glorify him. And the Gemara and Masachet Shabbat explained, how do I glorify God? By doing the mitzvot in the most beautiful manner that I can, right? And therefore, um, when I light the Shabbos candles, I want them to be beautiful. When I light my Hanukkah candles, I want it to be beautiful, right? And so too here, when I take the lulav and the etrog, I want it to be beautiful. And that's why uh, there are people who spend a lot, a lot of money um, buying these four species in order to glorify God. Uh, so that's just, I think, uh, an interesting idea. Um, here, the Gemara continues and talks about um, those berries, right? And what's the issue with the berries? Um, the Gemara explains that uh, the berries were either red or black, and this distracted from the beauty of the hadas. Again, if the hadas is all green, I don't want it speckled with other colors. Uh, therefore, if you took off the berries, then that would be fine. Uh, but if the berries were there, that is not okay. Uh, again, we mentioned you cannot take the berries off on the festival. The question is why? Uh, the Gemara explains that uh, you are what's called litaken kli. You are fixing a vessel. We are not allowed to fix a vessel on uh, the festival or on Shabbat, and therefore uh, you cannot pull them off. Um, however, right, if you, you're pulling them off to eat them, which I'm not sure that you can eat those berries, I don't know, uh, but if you put, put, pull them off to eat them, then that would be okay because you're not fixing the hadas, rather you're pulling them off because you want the berries. Um, okay. Uh, the next Mishnah, let's go on to the Arava, the willow branch. Um, so again, it's going to sound familiar. Uh, if the Arava was stolen or it's dried out, it is invalid. Uh, if it was worshipped for, idol for idolatry, it's invalid. If the top is cut off uh, or broken, it is also invalid. Uh, so here, is if, here it shows you uh, when the leaves fall off. These actually, at least in Israel, uh, these, these dry up very quickly and tend to, uh, the leaves do tend to fall off. So this is actually very uh, appropriate. Um, but uh, the Gemara, the Mishnah also adds, you are not allowed to use the tzaftzafa. Uh, the tzaftzafa seems to be another type of willow uh, where you can see here the leaves look very different. The Gemara is going to explain uh, what they look like, uh, but you are not allowed to use this as the willow branch, as the arava. Um, and again, um, if some of the leaves fall off, it's still okay. Uh, or if it grew in a field, it is also okay. And we'll see why we have to say this in a minute. Um, again, in the Torah, uh, 
uh, the the word for the willow uh, is the arvei nachal, right? The willows of the stream. Um, so therefore, uh, the assumption is that it grows by a stream. Um, and as I mentioned before, um, they have these elong elongated leaves. Um, but if they are, um, again, uh, sorry, one second. So um, again, they are, they need to, not they need to, but they seem to grow by a stream. The Gemara says at the top of 34, they don't have to grow by a stream. Meaning if you have a backyard and you have a willow tree uh, and it looks like this with the elongated leaves, you can use it for the four species. Um, so, right, we say that the uh, the leaves are like a nachal, right? They're like a river. They're elongated. Um, so that would be okay. The tzaftzafa, on the other hand, as you see here, um, it's it's a stem. First of all, here the sorry, the the willow that works is has a red stem or, or brown, I guess, reddish brown, and has long leaves. Uh, the tzaftzafa, which is invalid, has a white stem and has round leaves and serrated edges. So that you cannot use. Uh, and therefore, this is a way to uh, identify if you're using the correct um, is is uh, is a, the correct willow. Uh, so um, Lizette is telling us that this picture is not a willow. So that's good to know because the Gemara says you cannot use it. Uh, it's interesting that uh, maybe they maybe do those trees also grow by a river or a stream. Okay, so maybe that's the idea, right? Arve nachal, you might think any tree that grows by a stream. Uh, okay, great. So um, that would be maybe why the, the Gemara and the Mishnah felt the need to tell us it's not any tree that grows by a stream. It is only the willow, I guess, whose leaves look like a stream. Uh, so excellent. Thank you. This is a good audience participation. Um, Okay, let's continue on the last daf and daf 34. Um, the, here the Gemara talks about things that changed names after the destruction of the temple, which is just interesting. I think the idea is that, that when the Jews were spread out uh, in different, uh, first of all, definitely in different countries, but maybe even in different regions, um, words uh, have had different meanings, or I would say the same meaning had different words. Um, so the Gemara here tells us different words for the same idea, and it's important to know. The Gemara says, "Why does it really matter? Like, why are you giving me a uh, a uh, etymology lesson? Why do I care?" Uh, the Gemara says it's very important because when I'm first of all uh, trying to fulfill a mitzvah like this, I want to buy a willow. If I don't know the right word, uh, I might buy the wrong species. Uh, the same thing with the shofar, uh, this, and, uh, and also if I want to buy something, I need to know how to say it uh, in either Hebrew or Aramaic. Uh, so uh, here the Gemara tells us uh, on Daf 34 that we need three hadasim, uh, two aravot, again, three hadasim, three myrtle branches, two aravot, two willow branches, one lulav, and one etrog. Um, but interestingly enough, there is an opinion that you need just one of each. Uh, so that is very interesting. We are going to learn the numbers based on uh, the words in the verse, in the Torah. Um, again, kapat uh, tmarim, the lulav is one, right? So you only need one. Anaf et avot, right? So uh, this is uh, therefore, right, the hadas is called the anaf etavot. It's three uh, words to describe it. Therefore, you need three of them. Uh, arve nachal implies plural, so the the smallest number of plural is two. Uh, and again, pri et hadar, you only need uh, one. Um, and again, here uh, at the bottom of 34, uh, or I would say the middle of 34, uh, again, is that machloket, is the difference of opinion, whether you need to bind uh, the, mini, the, the species. Uh, also, do you need to bind the etrog to the other three, right? It, did you ever think about why all these three are, are bound together, but the etrog isn't? Uh, one is because it seems like it would be hard to do it, but you know, if we needed to, we would. Um, but interestingly, it's based on the verse um, because there's a there's no vav 
in between, right, um, the, the lulav and the etrog, right, meaning there's no letter that connects them, uh, but there is a vav connecting the lulav with the other two species, and therefore those three need to be bound together. The etrog is separate. Again, to fulfill the mitzvah, we do need to hold them together, uh, but they do not need to be bound uh, together. Again, as I mentioned, we need all four of these species. Vilekachtem, you need to take them. Um, in order to be complete, you need to actually physically pick them up. Um, and have them together. Um, and uh, interestingly enough, uh, we talked about the tip of the hadas uh, being cut off. Um, the Rabbi Tarfon actually tells us that it really could be cut. Why? Because he didn't want the sellers um, to hike up the prices when they saw that everybody needed these myrtle branches. Um, so I thought that that's just uh, interesting um, and, and goes back to my original point that all of these details uh, are important, but um, intrinsically there isn't really anything wrong with any of these um, um, invalidations, right? It's really about it being beautiful. Um, but uh, again, we don't want the prices to be uh, exorbitant, and therefore the sages were willing to say uh, that, uh, you know, we will let people use something that might be seen as invalid in order to keep the prices down. Uh, so with that, we are going to end, uh, and next week we will talk about the pre et hadar, the the etrog, and uh, there obviously we are going to have uh, more. I would say more uh, details in terms of what makes it beautiful and what makes it valid to be used. Uh, so, with that, wishing everybody a shavua tov, also chodesh tov, as we just started the month of Elul, uh, as we are getting closer to the new year. So, uh, wishing everybody a great week.